Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews Municipal Series, where we're talking with councillors from across Canada about themselves, but also their communities. Today, I am honored to have our guest onto the show today. She is a two-term councillor for the town of Torbay in Newfoundland and Labrador, but she is also, and I want to get this right here, the Vice President of Municipalities Newfoundland and Labrador. Please help me welcome to the show, Town Councillor Trina Appleby. Councillor, welcome. Thank you, Chris. So bef- uh, you've heard the show before. You know what I, the question I'm going to start with, and I want to ask it right off the bat. Councillor, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Uh, you know, like many of your guests, Chris, um, my family have been a part of municipal politics for quite some time. My my dad spent almost 30 years as a municipal councillor. My grandfather was uh, a municipal councillor, and when I was elected, uh, our mayor, Craig Scott, had uh, brought in a consulting company to uh, help us learn the ropes because there's a steep learning curve. Even if you spend your whole life around municipal politics, there's a very steep learning curve to learn what it's like to sit in the seat. And uh, when he brought in the, um, the consulting company, one of the chaps, he was from Mount Pearl, and he shook my hand and he said, nice to meet you. The other guy came over and he gave me a big hug and he was from my hometown. And he said, you know, Trina, I was there when your grandfather was deputy mayor. I was there when your father was mayor and deputy mayor. And I was elected deputy mayor at the time. And he said, I just want one thing answered. And I said, well, I say, he said, when do I have to do this for your daughter? And I, and I chuckled to myself and I can see both of my kids having leadership skills to serve in their community in some way or another, but it has been a part of my life, my whole life. And I've watched my family do it. I've loved every minute of it, Chris. And other than having my two children, Putting my name on a ballot is one of the best things I've ever done. I love serving my community. It's an amazing privilege. And I want to share my story with that today. You you talk about how your father and your grandfather were both in municipal politics. Um, I, I guess I'm an oddball when it comes to this, but whatever my father and my grandfather did, I tried to do the exact opposite. <laughs> what was the draw to municipal politics for you? Because you saw how your father and your grandfather dealt with municipal politics and it could have been different than it is today. But what was the draw that you said, you know what, that's what I want to do. I want to give back to my community that I reside in through the political realm and do it municipally because it's the closest to the community. Absolutely. And that's the thing, you know, we're the people who are the front line. We are the people that if something goes wrong, someone needs help, they pick up the phone and they call and they call and they say, hi, Trina, I don't know how to fix this. I don't know what to do with it. Can you help me? And, And helping people is what I like to do best, you know, listening, understanding what is the problem? What scope? can I participate in? Do Is it a provincial issue? Is it a federal issue? Is it a municipal issue? Is it a community organization issue? Is it a neighbor issue? There's all kinds of things that it could be. But if people know that you're there, you're present, you're willing to listen and work with them on whatever the issue is to help find solutions, then they appreciate that. And you know, there's a reward that people don't always understand that comes with being able to help people in the community. And they, they request that come are amazing. Can you help us? We're trying to put together something for seniors. Can you help us? We're trying to, you know, get a a sports league off the ground. We don't know how to do this. What do we do? And, you know, Chris, it's really rewarding. I've ran the soccer club here in my town for six years. And it's really rewarding when you can go in there on that field. And I remember uh, my my vice vice chair, because I was chair of the soccer club at the time. And he said to me after COVID, he said, it could be so easy to just not do this and to see families in there enjoying the fresh air and the outdoors and exercising and coming together socially for the first time in quite some time. It's quite powerful to have the ability to to have that kind of an impact. So, you know, really, I I had another group of people who were down at our Torbay Commons, which uh, we'll introduce you to when you get to come to Torbay and have a a visit with us. And uh, we're very proud of that facility. It's a brand new facility that we've put in place since I've been on council. And when I had a meeting with some colleagues and other board directors there um, yesterday, and I was so proud to show off the beautiful facility that we have and all the work that we're doing in our town. So it's it's that ability to serve that drives my want to sit at this table and, and, and be a part of our municipality, absolutely. 
was it a hard choice to serve in this capacity? So in 2017, when you were first elected as deputy mayor of the town of Torbay, you, you had to make that decision. Was it an easy choice to say, okay, now is the time that I want to get involved. Now is the time that I believe my voice needs to be at the town council chamber, uh, uh, table. What was that decision based on? And was it an easy choice? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, when I when I decided to run, I remember the mayor uh, reaching out to me and he came over and sat down. My mayor lives a couple of doors down from me and he's a good friend. And he came over and he said, um, he said, Trina, you'd be really good at council. And I thought about it. And at the time I was going through a divorce and I had a lot happening and I was thinking, oh, I'm not quite sure. And he said, think about it. And then a little while after I was home and there was a community event happening and he called me and he said, now will be, you're not going to get elected on the couch. Come on. And at that point, I thought, okay, maybe. So I went with him to the community event and he introduced me to all of the then council as a new member of council for Torbay. And they welcomed me so warmly, Chris, so just enthusiastically. And I thought, what a wonderful place to be. And I knew from my community work that we had a great community here and we had great leadership and I knew I could do great things. And I thought, you know what, this is a place I'd like to be. So with all the transition that was happening in my own life, it was a great opportunity for me to step into something new and have a meaningful role in my, in my world. And, you know, a lot of people look at me and go, you're a single mom, you work full time, you've got three dogs, what are you doing? You're on a half a dozen boards. But Chris, this is my idea of having fun. This is my idea of loving it. So once I had that experience with the council and I realized what good stuff I could do, I was so excited. And then when the time came to run, because I grew up in a family that was politically inclined, I knew how to run. I was on the, um, in 2007, I ran for the, uh, the NOIA board, which is the Offshore Oil and Gas Industry Association board here in Newfoundland, Labrador. And it was at that time, the largest oil and gas industry association in Eastern Canada. And I remember when I was asked to run for that, that at the time too, I was like, I know how to get elected, why not? And no one could believe the night that I was elected that uh, this little consultant from the Bureau of Peninsula was able to get herself elected to such a prestigious board. And what was even better about that night for me was at that time, the Minister of National Resources in the province, who was at one point our premier, was Kathy Dunderdale. And Kathy Dunderdale is a close family friend of mine. Her daughter and I have been best friends since we were in kindergarten. And she was the one in the room who came down, gave me a big bear hug and said, congratulations, Trina. And, you know, that same beautiful person, she was she was in the municipal council that I grew up watching with my dad. My dad was mayor. She was deputy mayor. They served together for years. So, you know, Chris, it, it, it wasn't a hard decision at all. And I remember in grade six, when we had my grade six graduation. They said, yeah, we think she's going to grow up to be a politician because she talks a lot. <laughs> so I don't I don't think it was a difficult decision at all. Uh, but when I made it and I paid my ten dollars for my ability to run, one of the counselors said, Appleby, you're everywhere. And I said, well, I'm getting my ten dollars out of it. <laughs> but, you know, I knew I knew how to get out. I knew how to get a hold of people. I knew how to run a campaign and I loved every minute. And I never dreamt in a million years that I would be the deputy mayor in this town. And that I won that on the first go was absolutely amazing. So yeah, it's it's incredible the opportunities I've had here. No question. Before we talk about the the first election and the, uh, your thoughts on it, you mentioned mm -hmm. something in that in your statement there that I want to sort of dissect here for a few seconds. You said you didn't really think about it until the mayor, your neighbor, came and mm -hmm. asked you about it. Um, yeah. I know uh, for you, getting more women participating in democracy, especially at the local level, is very important to you. How do we get that? How do we get more women involved? Is it like the mayor did to you, just asking them? Or is there other hurdles that people need to start looking at to get more women involved locally? Chris, that's a great question. And, you know, it's such a multifaceted issue. Not every woman is starting in the same space. You know, when, when I decided to run, I was a, a person who was going through a lot of personal change. Um, at any given point, there could be any number of reasons 
for a woman to participate or get involved. And I think, you know, in, in, in my work with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, I have the great honor of chairing our national committee for, um, we have a, a standing committee at FCM for increasing women's participation in municipal government across this country. And I'll never forget when uh, Garth Frizzle called me first and he said, Trina, would you like to, you know, vice chair this committee? And I, it was the best birthday gift I tell you I had ever had up to that point. And it was such a moving thing for me personally. And then I realized it's not just women, it's a number of people in our community who have different challenges and reasons why it's hard for them to see themselves in that space. So it's not only just about women, although it's very important to me personally that women get involved and have their voices heard. I think it's important that the council table reflects the community. And I think that, you know, with the growing that we have in our community, with the growth story we have in our community, with the diversity, inclusion, making sure that everybody sees themselves as a potential candidate, it's, it's a passion of mine. And it's something that I feel very strongly about. And as a Canadian, you know, we all have the right to live in our communities in safe, healthy ways and have a way to share in how we we see doing that best. And I wanna make sure that everybody knows there's a space there, there's a way, there's a place to learn. We have equal voice that's there to teach people and help provide support. You know, the Federation of Can Canadian Municipalities has put together some information and we've just launched our uh, online library of resources for anybody who may be interested. I know at the Municipalities Newfoundland Labrador table, we also have a, a women's uh, initiative there that's very, much moving and powerful and amazing. But we also have funding from the uh, the uh, FCM Camwell Project and the um, Provincial Municipal Affairs Department right now doing a, uh, a, a, a joint program around the Make Your Mark campaign. And our Make Your Mark campaign is a campaign that we deliberately have here in the province. It, it's set up so that everybody can see this as an opportunity for them. And, you know, some people think, and I, and I really want to talk about the fact that, you know, when I first ran, I remember my mother who, you know, spent all those 30 years with my dad who was on council. And she said, Trini, you've got so much going on right now. Why would you want to take this on? But I had that burning passion to want to make a difference in my community and lead. And I remember saying to her, you know, mom, this is something I'm meant to do. I want to do. And I think people need to find what their way is to lead. If it's teaching a yoga class, if it's sitting at a council table, if it's running your local soccer club, whatever it might be. But Chris, I think it's really important to make sure that people understand this is a positive. It's not a negative. I have been in this seat now for five years and I've had incredible opportunities that I wouldn't have had otherwise if I hadn't put my name on a ballot. And the last point, and they weren't wrong in grade six, I can talk, but, but the last point is my children, my children have spent the last five years watching their mom lead in their municipality in this way. And, you know, for women to know that they can do that as moms and, and not have to wait until later in life, I think that's very important. So, yeah, I get a little excited. I'm sorry for the long answer, but it's oh. just, uh, I'm it really be, passionate. It'd be that. really bad if you gave a short answer on an audio slash video podcast. So thank you so much for the long answer. But you mentioned something there that I want to pick up on as well. You mentioned that your mother came to you and said, you have so much going on in your life right now. Is that the main, and I hate to generalize here because I don't want to, but I'm going to generalize a little bit here. Is that the main reason why women don't get involved in municipal politics? Because it may seem like there's a lot going on and my life is already busy enough as it is, so I won't have time to add something else. Or is there another issue that I'm not seeing and you might be able to identify because you've been involved in this organization for so long, but also as the board chair and as a council counselor that women aren't getting involved in local politics, municipal politics, because of issue X or issue Y. What is the big stopping point for women to get involved in politics, do you think? You know, Chris, I don't think um, I don't think a lot of people want to put their name forward because of some of the topics that you've talked about in, in other shows with some of my colleagues. You know, there's the online harassment. There's the thinking it is what it is. If you put do your you, name forward, do you get online harassment as a counselor? No, I've I've had one troll 
and I've done a lot of work to learn about how do you, you know, um, live sp- safely in, in social media spaces. And, uh, and I remember when I got my one and only troll, it was during the, uh, the campaign, the last election campaign. And out of nowhere, this troll shows up and starts talking about how Deputy Mayor Appleby is not good for Torbay and she's not this and something else. And first I looked at it and I thought, you know, my strategy, my strategy is going to be, I'm going to reach out to my female colleagues. I'm going to ask them for their support. And they flooded my social media with positives. And I thought that was really great. And then I thought, hmm, you know what? I think I know how to handle this troll. So I found it quite amusing because I'm not, you know, a person who's easily offended by any stretch. And uh, and I thought, I'm going to have some fun with this. So I kind of had a hunch about who might have been behind my troll. I wasn't very far off. And I remember going to this person and saying, who was somehow connected with this group. And I said, uh, oh my goodness, I feel like I finally made it in politics. I've got my very first troll. It's brilliant. <laughs> I love it. It's like having my, pa- my face on the, we had a publication here called the Newfoundland Herald that was, that existed forever, a local publication. And I was like, oh my gosh, you feel like calling mom and tell her I got my face on the Herald. Like it was, it was one of those things that I played back with and went, you know what? No, you're not going to bully me. You're not going to make me feel small. I'm going to stand up. I'm going to use my voice. I'm going to have fun. And I'm going to see if that addresses it. And you know, what, Chris, the next day, this troll disappeared. So I feel that sometimes people feel that they have the right and they think it's okay to hide behind online spaces to attack people. It's wrong. It's bullying. It's harassment. I'm all about calling it out. I actually requested and asked our FCM president, Tanine Rudick, with my colleagues at the um, at our, our standing committee to have a town hall at the FCM, last FCM board meeting to talk about these issues. And it was really interesting from coast to coast, we had members of the municipal sector stand up and say, we've experienced some sort of harassment and bullying in this space. And my personal mission is to stop that. It has to stop You need to be able to lead in a safe way. Not to ask the stupid question here, but when you asked that question at the FCM board and a uh, counselor stood up, your colleague stood at the FCM board, was it majority women? Uh, there were a lot of women, absolutely, who have experienced uh, this issue. There's no question about that. But it's not just women. It's racializing. It's it's um, gender specific to some point. There's a lot of different ways that people are being discriminated against. And although I chair the National Committee around women, and I'm very passionate about getting women in the sector, making sure they know there's space for them, I think it's really important to make sure that that broad lens is is on the sector to make sure that, you know, everybody knows that we need more people. In my province this past election, we had an increase in, you know, women who put their names forward, which was great. But I feel that, you know, even in our most rural communities, smallest communities, I want everybody to see themselves. If I have a disability, what is it? How do I fit there? If I come from somewhere else, I'm I'm a new immigrant, you know, and I'm in the community and I wanna lend and bring my different lens, I want them to know they have a space here. And this beautiful, amazing woman who mentored me when I went to work in one of my positions, she said, you know, Trina, some of the best decisions are made by having diversity around them so that they can weather the storms that will come against them. And, you know, Chris, it's absolutely right. The more perspectives that you have, a man brings a perspective, a woman brings a perspective, someone who identifies differently and has a different lived experience, a parent, someone who's not, someone who's traveled, someone who's got one educational or business background, another, we all bring so much to the table. And I think it's important that we recognize that we don't have to agree on topics. We have to vote our conscience and we have to do the best we know how, but we have to respect each other and their interest to serve and bringing forward their experience and then taking all that information together and doing the best we can for our communities, province and country. Before I go back to yourself as a counselor in that first election, I want to end on this question in this part of the first segment here is, do you think we've come a long way? You've been in politics for five years now. You've seen some changes throughout the country because you're on part of FCM. Have we come a long way to diversifying and adding 
difference of uh, voices to the council tables, not only in Newfoundland and Labrador, but across the country, do you believe? The, the comment that was made when we had this conversation in Strathcona with my Atlantic caucus colleagues, one of the, the people there said, you know, my mother could never have done what you're able to do. And I do understand that. And there has been progress. And I'm standing on the shoulders of giants who have, you know, fulfilled these roles long before I have and have done amazing work. However, our country, if you look at where Canada fits in the world, we're the 60th when it comes to parity. If we keep going the way that we're going right now as a country, it's 256 years for us to meet parity, Chris. There's so much work to do. And, you know, there's two pieces to women in politics or really anybody in politics. The first part is recruitment. You know, are you interested? Can you put your name on a ballot? Would you run through the process of getting elected? Do you have the means, ability, and capability to get there? And then the second piece is retention. And there are a lot of people who get into the sector and go, whoa, and they step back because of bullying, harassment, experiences, not having the ability to say, no, actually, I get to have a life too. And and I've, I've noticed you've had this conversation with some of my colleagues, so I just want to touch on before we end here. But, you know, it's really important to serve your community. It's really important to be available. And to me, that's that's a very big part of what I do. But it's also very important to be a mom, to be able to go to my kids' hockey games and their, and their parent-teacher meetings and to live a life and do your own thing. So I think it's important that we continue this work and that we understand that there still is an awful lot of work to do, but that's okay because I'm ready to roll my sleeves up with many of our colleagues in this province and across this country, and we're going to keep working on that so you know future generations can stand on our shoulders. You, you beat me to my question that I'm going to ask a little bit later, but you you talked about it now, but I will ask you a little bit later about balancing and how do you balance that? Because I can imagine with all the boards that you sit on and trying to be a single mother, it is hard to do both. But before we do that, I want to go back to that very first election in 2017. You had mm -hmm. put your name on the ballot, not in a municipal realm, but on a board level, but municipal elections are a unique beast. And I think you and I will agree to that statement because you're not running as a party. You're not running as a group of people. You're running as an independent. Your voice is going to be on council. There are a few cities and towns across this country that do have party systems, but overall, the majority of them, you are one person, one vote. Putting your name on that ballot and walking into that ballot box for the very first time to mark an X beside your name as the potential next town councillor, what was that experience like for you? One of the proudest moments of my life. It's spectacular when you actually have the courage, and it takes guts to put your name on a ballot. Um, when you have the courage to do that, when you have a team of people working so hard to support you in 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 that movement it's just the best thing in the world and chris i've got to say i've had the best support you know i've had amazing friends who've walked door to door one of my best friends she hates politics and everything about it but she walked with me so i could knock on doors and and feel you know as, as a woman i don't know some of these people i'm from a town you know called bjorn on the the south south part of the the, the peninsula the most certainly parts of the island and I don't know everybody in this municipality but you know what I've got to be honest with you some of the proudest moments in my life have been around serving in this capacity as a municipal councillor if it was having my children there with me you know to to have my picture taken as a deputy mayor for the first time or to vote, you know, in that capacity, or to have one of the current counselors put his hand out and shake my hand and say, congratulations, deputy. Spectacular, spectacular experiences, Chris. Yeah. So on election night, you get uh, declared elected. What's mm -hmm. the first thought that goes through your head at that moment? Because I've talked to, and you've probably listened to a few episodes and uh, to many different politicians across this great country. And they always tell me that there is a sense of what did I get myself into? <laughs> what did I do here? I, I thought it was going to be something else, but now I'm elected. Was that, was that sort of mentality for you or because of your background with your father and your grandfather, you said, I'm ready. Let's roll up my sleeves and let's get down to work day one. 
Absolutely. That was my experience. It was not what have I got myself into. I knew exactly what I was getting myself into. I, I, I will openly admit there's a very sharp learning curve when you first get elected and there's an awful lot to learn. But I did know what I was getting into and I couldn't wait to get started. And my thought when, when I realized that I was the new deputy mayor of Torbay at that time was I just can't wait to tell my children. I want my children to know. And unfortunately, my children were not able to be there that night. But I would like to do a shout out to the town staff because they actually kept all of the stuff that was up there for the family portraits. And when my children were able to come and join me at the council chamber, they reenacted the signing of the documents as a counselor so my children could participate. So, you know, it's, it's just truly, truly spectacular, the sense of community that comes with being a part of an organization like our town council. And these people really care. They care about their community. They care about what they're doing. And, and our staff do too, you know, our staff to, to keep all that there and put it in place and make sure that my children and I got that opportunity. Just brilliant. Yeah. So that was my first thought, but I love it. When you first walked into council chambers as a elected official, Mm-hmm. Do you put a uh, responsibility on your shoulders every time you go into that chamber to make sure you are prepared, you are educated in the matter at hand, you are up to what the administration has given you for details in the reports, or is there a sense that you need to go in there with an open mind? Because I can imagine as a town councillor, you have to make your decision on the fly. It's not like provincial or federal politics where you get some time to make your mind up and you have people telling you sometimes what to do. As a municipal councillor, you have to make up your mind on your own. How much of a responsibility do you put on yourself to go into that council chambers with an open mind, but also educate it in the matter at hand? Chris, that's exactly what our job is. Um, you know, the, you'd be surprised you know, at how many people don't agree with that, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, 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 it's anyone that knows me knows that I'm happy to speak my mind and share my thoughts on that. And, you know, I feel very strongly that is our job. I took an oath when I became a counselor this time around and when I was deputy mayor to do what was best for my community, to be educated, to be informed, to understand the issues that I'm voting on. How can I take a decision in that chamber as a responsible person being put there with the public confidence if I haven't done my absolute best to understand that issue? And to the point of maybe sometimes driving the staff a little bit, not asking questions to understand, but I feel that's my responsibility. And I feel that, you know, respectfully reaching out and asking the people who are there to inform us and say, well, Councillor Appleby, there's this, have you thought about that? And you know, when we walk into those chambers, we have to have open minds on all the issues. I remember when I ran the first time and I knocked on doors, people said, which one of the five families are you here representing? And I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, there's certain families, old historic families, and and there's a history. And I went, okay, hold on. I came to Torbay in 2007. I have two kids. The only interest I have is my property. I have a passion for the growth and, and the future of our town. That's it. I have no interest in anything other than that. I'm here to do the best I can for everybody. And you know what, Chris, that's how I do my job. I show up every day. I walk into the chamber with an open mind. I am open to be, you know, I'm always informed when I go in there, but I'm open to listen to my colleagues, learn from the debate and take the decision with the best information I have. And if I don't feel I have the best information, then I'll state that I don't feel I have the best information and ask the council to take it back and reconsider. Or if I end up having to say no because I don't understand, I will vote a no and put my hand up and say, friends, I don't have access to what I need to make an informed decision and be clear about it. But but it's our responsibility as councillors once we're elected and the public has given their confidence to us to do our best for the whole of the community to show prepared, know what we're doing, ask the right questions, and be as best prepared as we can be walking in to take any decision in that chamber. Have you gone into a council meeting thinking you're going to vote one way and then heard an argument against your initial opinion and then voted another way? Are you open or are you usually well enough informed when you're going in that you're saying, okay, I'm going in with an open mind. I haven't made a decision because there could be something that could come up in the last minute. And 
when I sit down and it's presented, I may vote no. I may vote, hey, we need to go back and reconsider this because I need a little bit more information. Or you've you've made a persuading remark or a public hearing has made a pu- uh, persuading remark. I'm going to vote because it's the best interest for the town. And I my initial thought was wrong. You know, I, don't, I can't tell you exactly when I would have done that, but I'm very sure at some point I did. And I'll tell you why. Because I can't go into any any discussion, any vote so close-minded that I know exactly what it is you know when we're elected we're not we don't get this wonderful gift bestowed upon us of knowing everything and the beauty of a council is having colleagues with other lived experience and during that debate you know someone may say something that really triggers your thought and go oh you know what I didn't think of it that way I wasn't aware that that's the lens that we haven't looked at and I do know my council has it, you know, many an occasion that walk in, debate an issue and go, we didn't think about that. This is something that we need to go back and look at again and pull the item off the table, go back and do further work. At the end of the day, we see our job as showing up and do the best that we can for the people that are there. And 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 that's the way we should go in. We shouldn't go in closed mind. We shouldn't go in thinking I'm gonna do this no matter what. We need to be open always to what is in the best interest of the residents and the municipality. And if we stay focused on that, then to my mind, we're doing our job to the best of our ability. You, you represent us a, uh, a town in Newfoundland and town councilors, Newfoundland, Labrador. No, Newfoundland, Labrador. I apologize. Uh, you okay. uh, town councilors are an interesting entity in uh, politics because you live you in your community you reside in your community you grocery shop with the people you're voting on issues that are going to affect their pocketbooks their lands this that and the other we talked about balance a little bit beforehand but i want to go into a little bit deeper because how do you as the former deputy mayor now counselor for the town of torbay balance that because I can imagine you want your downtime as well. You don't want to be counselor Appleby 24, seven, seven days a week, as much as the job entitles it to be. You need to be mom as well. You need to be Trina as well. How do you balance that? And is there times when you have to tell residents, I would love to talk to you, but I'm with my kids right now. And I want to deal with, I want to be with them instead of dealing with a town issue right now. Yeah, you know, Chris, I think everybody understands that when we put our name on a ballot that, uh, you know, we, we've opened that door. I give my personal cell phone to anybody who wants it all the time. I'm the first one in our, you know, community Facebook group going, here's my cell phone, guys, reach out if you want to talk to me by all means. And, you know, it, being available is is very important. I get back to people as quickly as I can. I'm always open to and invite people to reach out and talk to me because, Residents share so much information and knowledge and wealth with us to help us understand how we do our job best. And lots of times people have called me and said, but did you think of this? Oh, I didn't. I'm going to take it back to council. But you're right. There has to be a a space of self-care and looking after us and, and having our time. And there is that, you know, there's a beautiful walking trail up behind my home. I take one of my excuse me, three dogs. And usually she's the one that comes with me because the other two like to hunt and they pull a lot. And I love them dearly and the dog park is next. So I take them there after. But we 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 go in there, sometimes just her and I with a headset on. If I see somebody, I'll, you know, and they want to stop, I'll stop and say hello. But, you know, it depends on the situation. My children say to me when they have to go shopping with me, mom, you talk too much, you know, too many people. Uh, so they don't want to shop with me anymore, which is great, <laughs> but, uh, it, but yeah, I say that in jest, but, but, uh, you know, Chris, it really depends on the time and space. And if I'm busy, I have a work obligation or another meeting or something to get to I'm just honest with people and people understand as long as they know that you care, that you're going to get back to them and that you're going to do the best you can to help them. Even if the issue they're working on is something that takes a longer time or it's harder to work through or whatever the issue might be as long as people know that you're genuinely there to do your job and help everyone you can to the best of your ability then people understand and it works really well so that that's my experience i i don't find i have any trouble saying no and i don't find that i have much trouble with balance and i'm very respectful of my time and others 
And, uh, and so I think that, that that works. And if people don't understand, if I'm being very honest, um, that's okay sometimes because, you know, I, I know that, Trina, we need to do this, we need to do that, we need to do something else. That's great. And I understand you feel that. Um, but, you know, you need to work with me because there's, you know, so many hours in a day and I have responsibilities. So we, we work together to find solutions and, and, and find that balance. But we certainly do. Speaking of solutions, I want to talk about the town as a whole now. Uh And before I start that, I'm going to preface this question as I've done in many other conversations because I seem to get very strongly worded emails from people. Um, This is a conversation between Councillor Appleby and myself. This is not a direction of council. This is not an opinion of a council. This is her opinion and only her opinion talking to the host of the cross-border interviews. With that being said, Councillor, in your opinion, what is the biggest issue facing the, uh, the town of Torbay today? In my personal opinion, I think uh, the lack of water uh, for our municipality is a big issue. We've had significant growth um, in our municipality over the last number of years. However, uh, we don't have, um, we have one pond that we have water that's coming out of. We've been trying for years to make sure that that water supply has better quality and, and, uh, and we're able to access the best quantity and we've continued to invest and apply for, you know, provincial federal resources to make that a reality. But for us to continue development in our town right now, we do need to have access to water supplies. So we are exploring another pond that may be feasible for water development. Um, we are, you know, reaching out and speaking to the city of St. John's and, 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 and you know, trying to figure out is there a way to fit in the regional water supply, but that's tapped out with all the growth that we've had here on the East Avalon region as well. So, you know, it, it's it's something I think that we have as a municipality a number one priority lens focused on. Having access to safe, clean drinking water is very important for our residents. And although only 30% of our municipality right now is on the municipal water, um, this is Canada. This is, you know, very important. This is a life safety issue. So, you know, all the issues that, that, um, that everybody addresses, you know, the ones that we were dealing with at the MNL table and at the uh, FCM table as well around housing and, you know, even a small town like ours, you're dealing with homelessness and you're dealing with climate change is a big one for us. You know, there's a lot of wastewater management is a big one for us. You know, there's a lot of issues in our community. Um, and they're all, all the ones that I'm mentioning here, are, you know, identified in our strategic plan. But water, I think if you were to ask the other members of council, um, they would also note that water is a, a very important issue for us as our municipality right now. You talk about growth and you talk about the need for accessible water. And I can imagine that is probably is the most dominant thing that you guys are talking about right now at the town council chamber, uh, uh, table. How do we how do we fix it? Because I know I know that's always a million dollar question that a lot of people are unable to answer because it's there's so many uh, different circumstances, whether it be federal, provincial regulations that you have to adhere to, but also their funding as well, because you can't squeeze blood out of a stone after you've squeezed it dry. How do you mm-hmm. fix this issue and how do you show your town, the town residents, that you are moving forward on this? Well, we all realize that municipal governance does not always happen overnight. It takes a little bit longer than other levels of government. Well, you know, Chris, I'm really lucky because I'm not only just a councillor in my municipality, I also sit at the executive level of our, you know, Provincial Territory Association Municipalities in Fine Labrador. I also get to sit at the Federation of Canadian Municipalities table. And it's very powerful to be in Ottawa and be in the room with the ministers and lobby them for infrastructure and explain to them exactly directly face to face what our concerns and issues are. And we have great support, you know, from all levels of government to have conversations about how do we work together to address this issue. Our MHAs, our MPs, you know, we're engaging, we're in dialogue, we're talking to our regional partners. There's there's a number of discussions that are happening here. But residents know they can see in the minutes that, you know, we've made applications looking for ways to, you know, get water treatment and and have accessibility. They know that 
we're bringing engineers and we're looking at these ponds and trying to figure to see if that works. We created a tiger team in motion that last year to get some of our you know municipal colleagues at our, our town to go work specifically on this item and they they took certain actions. So we are working very diligently to try to find ways. We had a infrastructure and public works meeting this morning before I started my day job. And we uh, we talked exactly about, you know, the 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 pipes that we have in the ground and what's happening with them, what's happening with pressure in the community and, you know, how, how do we address this issue? So I think people see that we're trying every which way we know how to have a multifaceted approach to find the answer and solutions here. But at the end of the day, you're right. It's not always easy. It's not always forthcoming, but if people see that we're trying and they know that we are, and anyone can stop me anywhere in the community and say, Trina, what are you doing about this? And I can say the very best I know how, if you've got anything else to share and add, please do, I'll bring it back. But we're exhausting ourselves trying to do the best we can for a municipality. You and I are political beasts, I, I I would say, because we we follow municipal politics before we you got elected. I follow it on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, are the people of Torbay engaged? Are the people of Torbay engaged on the issues that are important to the uh, community? Or do you have sects that are engaged and you hear the vocal majority and then there's the silent minority who are comfortable with the way that the, the town's running? And as long as their water is turned on and their, uh, their garbage is picked up at the end of the day, they're happy, they're content. How engaged is your community? I find our our community is really engaged, actually. There's different ways of engagement. You know, we have people who have certain issues that they're very passionate about and they call and they speak and they work with us on those. But, you know, we have a um, we have a local Facebook group where people can come in and post and and talk. There's two or three of them now, actually. And there is. Very... I was very shocked at that when I was doing some uh, minimal research. I was trying to like, find a logo and I was like, why is there so many Torbay uh, Facebook <laughs> groups? But there they are. <laughs> we, but that's the thing. And people are engaging in different ways. Sometimes they're at home and they're busy with their families and they're at the hockey arena going, oh, we need to do something. We need a second ice service. And they, they communicate that way. And I remember one time. Chris, when I, I, I served as the chair and the vice chair of the Jack Byrne Arena, Arena which is our regionally owned uh, ice surface here. And uh, I remember people saying to me, and I'm a hockey mom, so, you know, Trina, we need a second ice surface. And absolutely we do. But but there's a lot of layers to that. And I remember taking that on and working with my colleagues around it. And someone said to me, you and what army, Trina? want to see a second ice surface. I said, you want to see an army, watch out. So I worked with my colleagues at the board level. We hosted a, uh, a an in-person meeting before COVID at the time. And it, the room was full, standing room only. People were out there so passionate about this issue. So it really depends what the issue is for people and how they're engaged. But yes, we've got a young, active, vibrant community where a lot of people are involved, our seniors are involved, and we, we offer a lot. We offer a lot of programs and services for people who have abilities to participate in what matters to them. Absolutely. My last question on this segment before we turn to my favorite subject of tourism is, how do you balance the issues? Because I can imagine if I go to your community right now and I, I just walked up and down the street and I asked 100 people, they would probably give me one overarching issue, but they would all have unique individual issues. How do you as counselor then decide at budget time, at times when you have to decide where the money goes, the winners and the losers? Because I can imagine in a community like Torbay, who seems engaged, as you just said, who are engaged in the issues that are important to them, they want their issues fixed. But sometimes that pothole might not get fixed this year because we don't have enough money, but it's on next year's plan. So you're going to have to wait another year. Are people understanding when it's communicated to them that sometimes your issue is not the most important issue for the entire town? It may be for you, but not for the town. Yeah, you know, Chris, for a lot of us, I think, um, you know, it's not easy being a municipal councillor every day. It's not always easy taking decisions. And I've taken some pretty hard ones over my five years, I assure you of that. The focus has to be on the oath that we took when we joined office. And the decision is, how do we manage the municipality in a way that's best for residents and 
for the municipality itself as an organization. And although sometimes it's a hard having to look at someone and say, we can't do that this year, we're going to have to do it next year, or there's a reason for this. But if people understand what the reasoning is or the rationale, then they can usually go, okay, that makes sense as long as you're trying. So Chris, I don't find that there's a lot of negativity. It's always, as long as you're willing to work with me, as long as you're hearing it, as long as it's not falling off that agenda, and you're willing to, to work with me to get there, then people are very understanding. Well, I want to thank you so much for letting me talk about your town, but I want to talk about your town a little bit more because as a future tourist to your community, I want to know, and for those who are listening and watching, what are some of the highlights that people should be stopping in if they're thinking about coming through to the town of Torbay this year? Oh my goodness, Chris, we have such amazing, wonderful, beautiful things to share and offer. We have our regional trails that the town have put in place here. You know, you can go, like I was telling you earlier, but up behind my house where there's a pond, beautiful walking trails. We have the gorgeous, amazing East Coast trails that, you know, run all across the, uh, the Avalon Peninsula and they come right up here along our shores spectacular trails we have beautiful businesses we have lovely coffee shops and bakeries and a new uh, brewery that's uh, in the works hopefully it'll be open by the time you get here we have a uh, a brand new torbay common that has uh, multi-purpose rooms and a full industrial kitchen and a gymnasium we have um we have uh, our Torbay History House Museum that we just opened last year. It's spectacular, really looking forward to showing you through that. Um, we have breathtaking views, clean air. Torbay Beach is one of my favorite places. And when you get there, you'll, get, you'll understand why. It's just so good for your soul to breathe in the salt air. Sometimes you even see pods of whales right up there by the beach, uh, just swimming, it's spectacular. I would absolutely welcome and invite anybody who wants to come check out Torbay. And listen, personal tour, give me a call anytime. Happy to uh, happy to take anyone around for sure. But what about yourself? You, you've talked about the things that people should do. What do you do? What do you do to decompress in the town? Is there a spot? Is there a business? Is there a walking trail that you just go and just forget all your cares after a long day at council, long day at work, long day of being a mom. Absolutely. I am an outdoors kind of person. So the beach, Torbay beach is one of my favorite places. You know, you can go down there and just sit, listen to the birds and have the waves roll in and roll out. It's so peaceful and beautiful. There's, um, there's our beautiful trails. You can take them, walk them, hike them. I mean, until you've experienced them, it's hard to explain how spectacular they are. But, you know, for me, the, the, the place that I recharge is outside in nature, in energy, just enjoying everything that's happening around me. It's, uh, it's my gem, and there's an awful lot of ability to do that here in our, our beautiful town. I'm looking for it this summer to a seeing that beach and exploring some of the nature of Torbay with you. But Absolutely. I want to end on this question. And this is my, this is the question that usually stumps a lot of people when they have to talk about their community, but I don't, I find that odd. What makes the town of Torbay such a unique place to live, to work and to raise a family? Well, you know, when, before I came to Torbay, Torbay was a smaller community of you know set families that lived here and then we had a big expansion in the last number of years and so our town is really interesting because there's newer parts and there's older parts and the town i grew up with in you know the, the community i grew up in is a town called bjorn and the town logo was a blend of the old is a blend of the old and the new and it's kind of what torbay is like because we are just that we're a blend of people who've lived here their whole lives and people who have moved in in recent years. But Chris, all of us care about our community. We care about our homes. We care about our kids. We care about our hockey programs, our soccer programs. I forgot to mention our Jack Burn Arena facility out there. Like we care about our community and we care about our neighbors. Newfoundlanders are known to be friendly, happy, careful people who care for each other. And I can tell you during st storm again and COVID, you know, it was very apparent again. And we, we, we just have a fabulous community that I'm very proud to be a part of. I'm very proud to call home and I'm very proud to share with you when you come with our friends at MNL across the province and all of our friends at FCM 
right across the country. It's a beautiful place and it's very easy to be very proud of it. I am looking forward to getting out to Newfoundland and Labrador this summer to meet yourself, meet Mayor Breen as we head on. Hopefully we get yeah. a few more count of your fellow uh, municipal councillors across the, uh, Newfoundland and Labrador on the show. So that way I'm not just stopping in two places, but I get to explore all the great communities out in Newfoundland and Labrador. But I want to yeah. thank you, uh, Councillor Appleby, for sitting down, taking the last uh, 50, 55 minutes and talking about yourself and the town. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Chris, for the opportunity. And I really, you know, it's hard to turn down the opportunity to tell everybody how great this is because there's so many people who really don't understand how amazing municipal politics can be. And I just want to make sure that people can understand that there's a lot of amazing opportunities that come, even in the most rural communities, to serve your community, to serve your province, to serve your country. And if you're interested in any way to learn about it, to be a part of it, to find out anything about municipal politics, please reach out. I'm here. I'm always approachable and always happy to help. So thank you very much. No worries. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down social media, go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society, helps our democracy, and helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. We'll be back tomorrow with another great episode. Till then, keep talking.